This is a continuation of a series related to a course that I'm teaching on introductory proof writing. And here we're going to look at the idea of proof by contradiction. So let's maybe look at the basic outline of a proof of contradiction, explain why it works, and then go through a bunch of examples. So let's say you're trying to prove a proposition and that proposition is some mathematical statement P. So the outline of the proof, and obviously you can change the wording slightly and every proof will be a little bit different, but I would say this is a good place to start. You might want to say, by way of contradiction, suppose not P. In other words, you're supposing that the proposition is false. So it's also nice here to give a clue to your reader that you're proving this by contradiction. And then here is like an outline of all of the math that's happening. So you first want to unpack not P with definitions and calculations. So maybe P is something like F is a continuous function. So not P would be F is discontinuous somewhere. Or maybe P is N is an even integer. And so not P would be something like N is an odd integer. You know, something like that. So now we're going to notice that this leads to the truth of a statement and its negation. So in other words, the statement A and the statement not A are simultaneously true. And A seems a little bit unrelated to our initial uh, proposition or our initial statement that we're trying to prove. Um, and that's obviously impossible. So a statement and its inverse cannot be true at the same time. And then you'd want to finish this off with something like a contradiction, thus P is true. Okay, so this can be used to prove conditional and non-conditional statements, but in case you're using it to prove a conditional statement, I want to recall how to negate a conditional statement. So if you've got the conditional statement P implies Q, the negation of that is the conjunction P and not Q. So if you're trying to prove P implies Q, you would start off with by way of contradiction, suppose P and not Q right here, because that's the negation of P implies Q. Next, here's a truth table that explains why this proof by contradiction works. So what I want to notice is that in this proof, we have actually proven that not P implies A and not A. So notice that here our P column and our not P implies A and not A column are identical, meaning that those are equivalent mathematical statements. So if we've proven this over here, then that means we've proven this over here as well. Now, there's not much to this um, truth table. Notice that A and not A is always false, so there's really nothing to that. Okay, so let's go ahead and clean this up and then we'll start some examples. So for our first example, we'll look at an extremely classic proof by contradiction. And that is that the number the square root of two is irrational. So let's jump into it. So we wanna do by way of contradiction. So I'll often shorten this on the board as BWOC, by way of contradiction. And while you're writing your first draft for proofs, you should feel free to do this. But when you're typing up your final solution to hand in, you should always put everything all the way written out in complete sentences. So by way of contradiction, we want to suppose that the square root of 2 is rational. In other words, it's an element of the rationals. But if it's an element of the rationals, then that means we can write it as a ratio of two integers Furthermore, those integers can be relatively prime. In other words, they share no common factors. Well, except one. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's write the square root of 2 as P over Q with the GCD of P and Q equals 1. Okay, nice. Now what we'll do is maybe multiply both sides of this equation by Q. And so that means we'll be living within the integers instead of within the rational numbers because we'll have root two times Q equals P. P is an integer. So let's do that. So now maybe note that the square root of two times Q equals P 
Thus, we can square this equation and get 2q equals, sorry, 2q squared equals p squared. But if p squared is equal to 2q squared, that means p squared is even and thus p is even. So we'll write that down. So p squared is even, thus p is even. But we know if p is even, we can write it as a multiple of two. So let's do that. So let's write p as two times m for some integer m and then run this back into this equation right here. So maybe we'll put like notice or observe that this means that 2q squared equals 4m squared. And again, that's by plugging it into this equation right here. Thus, we have q squared equals 2m squared. And that's just by dividing both sides of this equation by two. Um, but that means that Q is even. But look at what we've got. We've got P is even and Q is even. So notice that we have two divides P and two divides Q. But if two divides P and Q, then the GCD of P and Q must be bigger than or equal to two. Because notice it's got a common divisor of two, meaning that its greatest common divisor is at least two. But look at what we've got. We've got the GCD of P and Q is one, and it's bigger than or equal to two. But that's obviously a contradiction, so we would finish this off with maybe a final statement. So this is a contradiction. Thus, the square root of two is not a rational number and that would finish it off. Okay, let's get rid of this and we'll do another example. So our next example is pretty classic and it's due to Euclid and has to do with the infinitude of primes. So we're gonna prove that there are infinitely many primes. We're gonna do this by way of contradiction. So there's a bunch of ways to do this. In fact, I think I made a video on a really, really hard way to do this just for fun. You guys can find that if you want to. All right, so again, we're gonna start off with by way of contradiction. Suppose there are not infinitely many primes. In other words, there are only finitely many primes. But if there are only finitely many primes, that means we can list them in a finite list. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll say our finite list is P1 times P2 all the way up to Pn. Next, we're gonna construct a new number that cannot be written as the product of those numbers. But that means there must be a new prime. So let's maybe write that in the following way. So let's consider capital N, which is equal to P1 times P2, all the way up to Pn plus one. Now we'll show that this capital N is not divisible by any of these primes. So we can do that in the following way. So let's note, that for all i between one and n, pi does not divide one. Well, the only thing that divides one is one and negative one, but we know that one and negative one, neither of those are prime numbers. So that means pi cannot divide one, but that means that pi cannot divide n minus p1 all the way up to pn. Well, that's because n minus p1 up to pn is just one by this equation right here. But pi does divide just that product, p1 to pn, so pi does not divide n. Okay, so we've worked it out that pi does not divide n. But what that tells us is that n is either prime or it's divisible by a prime that is not on the list. So let's write that down. So n is prime or divisible by a new prime. So I'll just put new prime to mean a prime not on that list. But what that tells us is that our list was not complete. So our original list it was 
not complete. But that gives us a contradiction. So you would end that with a contradiction and thus there are infinitely many primes. So let's see what we've got here. We first started off supposing that we had a complete list of primes right here. And then we showed that we actually did not have a complete list of primes. But what that means is there must be infinitely many primes by way of contradiction. Okay, so let's clean this up and we'll do maybe two more. So for our next proposition, we're gonna prove that there are no positive integer solutions to x squared minus y squared equals one. So what I mean by positive integer solutions is that x and y are both positive integers. That means I'm not including zero here. Okay, so let's jump to it. We're gonna again do a proof by contradiction. So by way of contradiction, Let's suppose that x and y are positive integers. And here, like in the US, generally we use natural numbers for positive integers. But I know that if you're watching this from somewhere else, that may not be the case. I don't think that's a really big deal as long as we're clear with what's going on. So let's suppose x, y are natural numbers such that x squared minus y squared equals one. Okay, but notice that x squared minus y squared being equal to one means that x squared minus y squared is bigger than zero, which means x is bigger than y. So let's go ahead and write that down. So x is strictly bigger than y. We get that immediately. Okay, nice. Next, we'll go ahead and factor this. So let's do that. So let's note that we've got a difference of squares. So we can factor that difference of squares as x minus y times x plus y equals one. Next, since we're working over the natural numbers and x is bigger than y, then that means we factored the number one as the product of two natural numbers. But the only way to factor one as a product of two natural numbers is as one times one. So that means that x minus y equals one and x plus y e equals one. So x minus y equals one, x plus y equals one. But now you can use your favorite way for solving a system of equations and see that maybe adding the two equations gives us two x equals two, which means x equals one, which means y equals zero. But y equals zero means that y is not a natural number. So let's write that down. So thus, y is not a natural number. So just to really spell it out in terms of our outline over here, what we have is that y is a natural number and y is not a natural number. In other words, y is a positive integer and y is not a positive integer. But that's obviously a contradiction. Thus, there are no such solutions. So that finishes our proof. And when I say stuff like that out loud, you would really need to write it down like if you were writing up a solution for a homework like I did on the first proof. But often when you're presenting, you say some things that you don't end up that you would end up writing down otherwise. So me putting a little contradiction symbol there is a kind of a hint at that. Okay, so we'll do one more. So now let's look at our last example. So we wanna show for all integers a and b, a squared minus four b is not equal to two. So this is kind of like the one that we just looked at, but just phrased a little bit differently. So again, we're going to do this by way of contradiction because that's the whole goal of this video. So let's do that. So by way of contradiction, let's go ahead and suppose that a and b are integers such that we do have a solution. So we've got a squared minus 4b is equal to 2. Now let's see what we can get out of that. So notice that we can maybe move some things around here and see that a squared is even. So let's do that. So a squared equals two times two b plus one, which is even. So if you know anything about even perfect squares, you kind of already see that there is a problem. And I'll just say this in words because we'll continue this proof to a little simpler solution, but notice that this number right here is congruent to two mod four, 
but we know that perfect squares are never congruent to two mod four. But again, we're gonna do this um, without using that fact. Okay, so we've got a squared is even, thus a is even. So anytime a square is even, you know the number that is being squared is also even. Great. So now let's write a equals 2m for some integer m. It's kind of the definition of an even integer. And then plug that into our setup equation. Um, maybe we'd say observe. But that means that um, a squared minus 4b is equal to 2m quantity squared minus 4b, which is equal to 2. Thus, what do we have? We have 2m squared minus 2b is equal to 1. And I did that just from dividing both sides of this equation by 2. Okay. But now let's divide both sides of this equation by two again. Well, obviously we can kind of see that there's a problem already because the left-hand side is even, but the right-hand side is odd. But let's maybe go for a little bit different of a contradiction just for fun. Okay, so maybe we would say notice, this means that the number one half can be written as m squared minus b m and b are both integers, so that means m squared minus b is an integer. So we've ended up with this fact that one half is an integer. But one half is obviously not an integer, so this is our contradiction. So maybe we would write this as a contradiction. And then finally finishing it off with thus, we could write this statement up here, a squared minus 4b is not equal to 2 for all a, b, which are integers. So that would be maybe a good complete proof of this statement. And that's a good place to stop.